Today I'm going to talk about the lazy way to stay in love. My story begins in the reptile tent of the local county fair. My husband and I walked into the tent and there in the corner, in a folding chair, was a guy with about three and a half feet of live alligator resting on his lap. You could pet the alligator, so while I was petting it, I asked him, why is this animal so tame? He said, I pet it daily. If I didn't, it would soon become wild again and it wouldn't tolerate this. Now that was interesting to me for a couple of reasons. First of all, I had just begun to learn about attachment cues. Attachment cues are subconscious signals to a really primitive part of the brain. And what they do is make emotional ties almost effortless. The second thing that was interesting about that is that the experts all say that attachment cues are unique to mammals. Well, obviously that alligator didn't know that. But the reason the experts say that is because alligators don't really need those kinds of bonds that I'm talking about between them and their offspring. A reptile mom can just lay eggs and wander off. A mo mammal mom, however, she, if she wants her offspring to survive, they have to stay close to her mammaries until they are weaned and can go their merry way. You're probably wondering what a typical attachment cue would be between mammals. It would be things like huddling together, licking, grooming, feeding the infant, paying attention to it. That's how my mammals stay bonded. These are really powerful cues. Here's a little story to show you just how powerful they are, even in humans. An American couple adopted a Romanian kid at about age seven. He had spent the first years of his life in a crib with another child in a room full of cribs, two kids to a crib. He did not make the adjustment well. His parents tried every kind of therapy over the next six years while he was putting over a thousand holes in his bedroom wall. His mom needed a bodyguard when the father wasn't around because he was so violent. The temple they belonged to threw him out, said he couldn't come back. The situation was really ugly, but his mom was a therapist and determined to reach him. Finally, someone suggested attachment cues. So this couple took their now adult-sized son, put him on the couch, propping him with pillows at one end, over their laps. They fed him ice cream. That was a bribe, but it was also a bonding behavior. They looked him in the eye and they listened to what he had to say for about 15 minutes a day. Within three weeks, he was bonded to his adoptive parents. And there's a wonderful talk on the web of him thanking his parents and the temple for an award they gave him. Now that you understand the power of attachment cues, let's fast forward to pair bonding. Most mammals don't pair bond. They change mates every mating season or more frequently if they happen to have sex more frequently. But there's a weird group of mammals, about three to five percent according to the experts. And I don't mean absolute numbers, I mean species. So three to five percent of mammal species do something bizarre. It's called pair bonding. That doesn't mean they necessarily live happily ever after, but it does mean they form long-term bonds because their brains are set up slightly differently. Humans are in this group. So is another primate called the tamarind monkey. How do you suppose the adult pairs stay bonded to each other? That's right attachment cues. The list is slightly different from the ones between infant and caregiver though. For example, tamarind monkey pairs who want to stay together do a lot of tail twining and they huddle together frequently and they do tongue flicking, whatever that may be, but it's apparently very romantic in tamarind land. Now, humans do something very similar all you have to do is re watch a romantic movie or listen to a love song and you'll hear what our bonding cues are. They're things like kissing with lips and tongues, skin to skin contact, any kind of comforting touch, massage, stroking, even spooning your partner. Also those little wordless sounds of contentment and pleasure like mmm. Eye gazing is another one. In fact, a thousand years ago during the courtly love tradition, Eye gazing was considered to be the most powerful way that lovers could bond. If you're interested in a whole list of bonding behaviors, they're available on the website. These bonding behaviors are the lazy way to stay in love. 
If you want to use them for that though, there's a few more things you might want to know about them. First thing you need to know is they don't have to be effortful at all. They can be as simple as spooning your partner for a minute before you fall asleep. Not long ago, I wrote an article about this and a husband actually tested it and he wrote me back and he said, these bonding behaviors work. He said, from time to time during my long marriage, my wife and I have just gone, gone off of each other and I never really knew what caused that. Maybe we had guests and couldn't get our snuggle time in or one of us was traveling. He said, but I've tried these now. And within a few days, the juicy feelings can be back in the relationship. I just engage in them and there's sort of a snowballing effect. He said, not only that, they only have to be a minute long. He said, I've worked out if they're less than a minute, that won't work, but a minute long will do it. The second thing you need to know is that the alligator trainer was right on the money. You need to do these things daily or almost daily or they simply don't work. The part of your brain that they're operating on, it doesn't care if you're wearing a wedding ring, it doesn't care who you walk down the aisle with, it doesn't care if you know nonviolent communication or negotiation techniques. It's just looking for those old primitive signals and if it doesn't get them on a regular basis, your relationship can kind of erode at a subconscious level and you won't even know what happened. Third thing you need to know is they sound like foreplay, some of them, and we do incorporate them in foreplay, which is a great idea, but foreplay is different. It's about building up sexual tension. These behaviors work because they relax an old part of the brain. That part of the brain is called the amygdala. It does a lot of things in the body, but one thing it also does is keep your defenses up unless it gets the signals that it's safe. So it's always deciding is something safe to a approach or should it be avoided. It's what guards you against insurance salesmen and stockbrokers. The amygdala responds to a neurochemical called oxytocin which dials it down. And guess what? Bonding behaviors produce oxytocin. It's called the cuddle chemical. So these behaviors we're talking about release oxytocin in the brain that calms the amygdala down your defenses are lowered vis-a-vis -vis that person because you feel relaxed and safe and that's how the bond occurs. So the lazy way to stay in love is actually just the effort of keeping the amygdala off of red alert and feeling more relaxed. The last thing you need to know about these bonding behaviors is that they don't have an expiration date. Often we pair bonders have a sort of honeymoon frenzy at the beginning of our relationships. But the neurochemicals behind that return to baseline within a year or two. These bonding behaviors, however, can continue as long as you continue to use them and deliver those signals to each other. I'll close with an anecdote about a couple from the UK who were married happily for 80 years. The story I read was very touching, actually. It was about how they died within a few hours of each other of natural causes at extremely ripe old ages. The journalist added that the couple never went to bed without a kiss and a cuddle. So I ask you, was that just an empty correlation? Or had this couple somehow stumbled upon the wisdom of the lazy way to stay in love?